Uh, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you taking time out of your um, busy schedules and your Friday to come and uh, enjoy a day with your colleagues. Uh, I thought uh, a couple housekeeping items for those of you that have not been in the building before. If you go out into the atrium area, look for the exit sign. That's uh, kind of diagonal from where we're at. And the bathrooms are, you take a left and the bathrooms will be on the right. That's always an important item. Um, if you look at your packets, the items on the right side have the agenda and the materials for each of the presentations today. On the left were some items that were asked for, um, just for your information. If you have any questions, please let us know. I wanted to give a thank you out to a couple of people. Um, Don Shavy, Deb Fellner, Jocelyn Goheen. They did a lot of work to help put this on, and so I wanted to give them a give them a, them a thanks. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't have been able to to do this without their help. Um, I thought we'd start with introductions while we're waiting for um, Don's a little stuck in traffic, oh, sure. and then he'll be given a welcome, but we'll start with introductions. Uh, I know a lot of people here, but there are several that I've never met. I recognize your name as being part of EIO, but uh, I have not actually met you. So I am Tracy Powers. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Grand Rapids campus, and as we go around, I'd like you to give your name, the program that you work with, or your role, and uh, the site that you're at. All right. Uh, I'm Nick Patterson. I uh, work with digital animation, excuse me, digital animation game design uh, here. And what else? I'm faculty uh, and advisor. Pretty much the same thing. I'm Marty <laughs> Lear, uh, digital animation game design. I am a faculty person as well as an advisor. Uh, David Baker, uh, Digital Animation Game Design, uh, Faculty uh, Department Coordinator, Advisor. Hi, I'm Andrew Smith. Uh, pretty much the same thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, program Advisor and Instructor. Is this one? Yep. All right, I went on. Uh, Casey DePew, Admissions uh, in Big Rapids. Cynthia Blazak, uh, here in Grand Rapids, admissions and part of the marketing team. Good morning, Janelle Hemingway, director for the Flint Midland region. So Mott Community College and Delta College partnerships. Hello, Kim, Kim Brianamore, outreach coordinator for the Delta College area. Good morning, Tim Cassidy, uh, CJ faculty advisor, Flint and Midland. Good morning, Steve Segrist, uh, Lansing, and Flint, uh, faculty and advisor, criminal justice. Justin Ferris, uh, oversee Lansing and Howell. Don Shavey. <laughs> Don Shavey, I'm um, switching roles from director of student services to our senior academic advisor here in Grand Rapids. Uh, Brian Bauman, uh, director, Southeast Michigan region. Good morning, everybody. I'm Deb Thalner, and I'm the director of our um, online programs. Hello, I'm Carrie Sechrist. Um, I work for a school of education primarily. I do a little help for Roxanne every now and then, uh, and sometimes I uh, answer any questions about anything at any time in Traverse City. Hello, I'm Katherine Belkowski, and I'm Outreach Coordinator for the Southeast Region. Hi, I'm Julius Moses, uh, Faculty Advisor, Criminal Justice in Port Huron and Harper Woods. Good morning, Maggie Edwards. I teach and advise Criminal Justice in Muskegon and Grand Rapids. Uh, Jerry Emmerich, I'm Faculty and Advising in Grand Rapids and Big Rapids in Online. <laughs> ISI. Yeah. Yes, I'm Doug Blakemore, ISI also, and I uh, faculty and advisor for Big Rapids, Delta, Lansing, and this semester probably Jerry and I are sharing Traverse City in that while Greg is gone. Mike McCaw, advisor and um, faculty, criminal justice, Dwajak in Grand Rapids. Brian Hefner, uh, instructor, advisor, Traverse City criminal justice program. 
Hi, Maria Putt, uh, Assistant Director for Criminal Justice for all the statewide locations. Uh, Peter Raphael, I'm in Traverse City. I'm in the business program, uh, coordinator, advisor, faculty. Uh, Joe Wist, manufacturing, uh, Big Rapids and Grand Rapids, advising and uh, faculty. Last but not least, Mike Wiggins, criminal justice faculty advisor. I'm at Oakland, McComb, and Schoolcraft Community Colleges. Uh, <laughs> Good morning. I'm Cheryl Clucci, and I'm the assistant dean, and I'm located in Big Rapids. Good morning. My name is Sharon George, and I'm with the College of Business in Big Rapids. Uh, Joe Joyce, uh, Industrial Technology Management, uh, Faculty Advising and Program Coordinator. Uh, that's uh, Grand Rapids and Warren. Hi, Roxanne Cullen, and I'm here uh, both really for uh, languages and literature. I'm doing the scheduling, so I interact with a lot of you. And then uh, primarily here for the Bachelor of Integrative Studies. Good morning, Paul Blake, Academic Affairs, Main Campus. Uh, Lisa Topping, coordinator for Dwajak. Dee Dee Stakely, director of Transfer Services Center. Um, offices in Big Rapids, but I go to all the campuses. Uh, Dan Turry, CIS, CIT faculty, and uh, also spending time in Montcalm. Hello, I'm Don Brecken. I'm with the College of Business uh, Management uh, faculty and Southwest Business Advisor stationed here in Grand Rapids. Katie Lair, off-campus health professions advisor and online, Grand Rapids, and wherever else. So, <laughs> um, Dion Sargis, online programs advising. So everywhere. All right. Thank you. All right, we have uh, our welcome up next, and our Vice President of the Extended and International Operations, Don Green. Oh, Jocelyn snuck in here. Jocelyn Goheen, I'm transitioning into new Director of Student Services for EIO. And that's in Grand Rapids. Good morning, everyone. Okay, first of all, just that table back there we will have to pay more attention to. Maria couldn't remember who she was or what she did. And then Peter decided he doesn't want to share with his table mates. So I'm not sure what that's all about, but they're having issues already. Uh, <laughs> that might be part of the problem. That was definitely part of the problem then, okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here and for investing your time. If you look across the room, you represent the advising and, um, and service to probably roughly 5,000 different students from Fair State University at a minimum, not including those that we serve in Big Rapids. It's probably closer to six or 7,000 because as you know, students bounce in and out with us and tend to be over at our various community college partners as well. So, you're making a difference in the lives of so many different people. And the thing is, sometimes when you talk to faculty, what they tend to do is they put on their faculty hat and they think faculty means teaching. There's nothing wrong with that. We need great performance in the classroom. But when you do the studies and you do the research, what you find out is completion of degrees the whole retention piece, speed to diploma, all of those things often come down to advising. And you guys are not only great at being able to manage the degree program and all of the, the uh, transfer credits, but also you're really there as a cheerleader, support, a pat on the back, letting people know that they can do it, that they can get through it. And that's just absolutely huge. And I know that takes a lot of energy for all of you but I really want you to know you have my heartfelt appreciation for it. Have a great day today. Speak up, share, give best practices, let people know what's going on in your part of the world. One of the things that I find really valuable is when somebody from Macomb says, this is what we're doing, 
and we hadn't even thought about it in Muskegon, or somebody in Traverse City says we're doing this, and we hadn't even thought about it at SC4. Oh, that's in Port Huron for those, St. Clair County Community College for those on the west side. Um, so anyway, share and have a good time, and if there's anything you need, please let me know. Thanks. Thank Um, our first session is going to be with Casey DePew. Uh, we had a lot of advisors express an interest in um, really getting some more information on the uh, admissions process and uh, really trying to understand that process. So Casey is going to give us her infinite wisdom on that topic. <laughs> no. Good morning, everyone. Oh, we'll try that again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Um, for those of you that do not know, I am physically located in Big Rapids. Um, I am in the Timmy building on second floor with other admissions just because that's where transcripts are, that's where general questions are, brainstorming, all of that. But you can always reach me at the off-campus admissions at ferris.edu. That's where I ask for everything to go. And that inbox gets checked whether I'm there or not. A lot of people have access to that, so that always gets answered. In your packet, there is a little admissions advising guide. And this will roughly follow along with what I will go by slide by slide. But this is just a good resource to have on your desk and have open when students come to meet with you. Okay, the first step is the student should fill out an online application. It is free, we are doing only one application now, so no matter what campus, what program they want, they're all filtering through one application. Um, there is no short readmit application anymore. It was, even though it was called a shorter readmit application, it wasn't shorter on our time. The student just filled out a one-page questionnaire, but it had to be from Ferris if we're still missing information. I'm always okay. asked, you know, I'm calling you, I'm calling you, yep. they're telling me it arrived. I don't see it in extender yet. Is there going to yep. be some way that as soon as you receive it, that it's like some check box that says, you know, mm -hmm. at least three tiers, and it's yep. not in the system yet? Yep, we'll, I'll get to that. I'll show you later in Banner, um, but like I said, once that app tracker gets working, it'll feed from Banner and then the students will know too. So that should cut down on some of the emails and phone calls that you get from students saying, what's going on? <laughs> and then um, part of the comm plan, we are sending out information to the students to go look at the app tracker so they won't have to find that on their own. We're going to be messaging them saying, hey, look at this for any questions. Uh, the testing office is third floor in Timmy, and they handle the ACTs, the CLEP, the AP credits. CLEP and AP, they do have to come from the institution. We can't take that off of a GRCC transcript or a high school transcript. The scores do have to come from the institution. And then that gets sent up to testing. It's best to contact them if you have questions because their processes are always shifting and you know, just I want to make sure that you guys get the right information of what they're really accepting at the time. So that's their information. Okay, now this is a little bit smaller because it's a lot of information. <laughs> this is actually how a document is processed in Banner and Extender. <clears throat> okay, once the transcript is received, in our office, it is stamped official and with the date. Did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> um, once it's stamped, it gets put in a pile to be scanned into Extender. And Extender is just where we house all the paper documents electronically so we don't have to hang on to paper or make sure paper gets to right locations or different people. Once it's scanned into Extender, it has to be manually indexed to a student's file. 
that means that a worker is actually looking at that transcript, verifying the person's name, date of birth, school, all that information, and attaching it to an application or previous record. Once it's indexed, <clears throat> excuse me, the transcript will show up on the checklist, and then that's where that app tracker comes into place that it's showing up there. And it will also show up that we need to process it. What we process in admissions is the date it came in and then all the information on it. So we load when they attended, how many credits they took, that includes Fs and Ds, anything that's may not even transfer in, it's just everything that they took, and their GPA, that's for college. For high school, it's just their GPA and test scores if they're on there. Now, depending on the time of year, this could take a week to three weeks because if it's in May or June, high schools are finishing up, everybody's sending batches of high school transcripts. So you're gonna get you know, 200 transcripts in a day that need to be processed all the same way so that can slow it down a little bit. Um, but if it's in you know, the middle of July, it's a little bit slower right now for high school transcripts, although college transcripts are coming in because people are finishing up their summer classes trying to get in for fall. So just kind of keep that in mind that depending on the time of year, there may be a couple lag days between when it's actually in our office and stamped and on the student account. Okay. Yeah. What you just said, <laughs> that you are not going to be processed for that term. And that's your I mean, smile, probably no. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's definitely a concern because we don't want to give the students false hope that we're going to get them into classes, really. Um, it, <laughs> it has more to do with actual the classes and financial aid being processed. It's not just getting them through the admission process. It's not something that um, is a very quick process once they're admitted. And that's something that the students do have to understand if they're coming to you at the end of July. Realistically, it's not just can we get, it, get you in. So when we're reviewing documents, sometimes we notice, this is going back to what I said earlier about I'm adding things to the checklist. If somebody fills out their application and they say they went to GRCC, their GRCC transcript comes in and it has Lansing and Baker and you know whatever else listed on it, I am adding that back on the checklist that we need those transcripts. I'm not letting their application just fly through with a GRCC transcript. Um, so that happens in this general document processing time. And again, that can add some days onto their application if they tell you that they just went to GRCC and then we realize that they didn't. Um, this is also where if they send in their college transcript, we can. Another one, sorry. I'm going to keep doing this because I run into this all the time. You know, I took 
classes, I wrote it on my application, but none of those classes I'm going to use anyway. It's yeah. one class. You're going to hold me out of out yeah. of fall term because I didn't send a transcript. Is there a way around it? There is no way around it, is there? No. If they nope. list it, they must send transcript. Yes. Not only if they yep. didn't list it, I mean, you know, even if they didn't list it, if we see yep. they transfer GRCC credit over to U of M Flint and send us the U of M Flint one, Casey's going to go, oh, looky there, you need both now. Gotcha. Yep. So we're looking for reasons to reject yep. students. We need every... It, yeah, it's a general... Explain why you need... Well, it's a general Ferris policy that we need your full academic history and that eventually gets back to accreditation that we're getting everything from the student. We're making sure that they're meeting our GPAs. We're making sure that they you know, are going to be an okay student and really helping them succeed too because if they're bouncing around, is it in their best interest to you know, keep bouncing? And eventually, too, they are running out of financial aid. They're going to hit that where they've taken too many credits. So we do need to know that information, and that helps get the full picture of the student for admitting. Yeah, I think a big part of that, too, is um, you'll find a lot of those students that are hesitant to send that transcript have like a $5,000 balance or oh, yeah, something at that university. So that's so typically why they don't want to. And then that's a collection issue for us to take out. those classes didn't matter because they were and then come to find out it met a requirement you know we'll actually know that mm -hmm. so yep we are very transfer friendly that we do try to award as much credit as possible um, and we actually do award credit for some institutions that other places don't take so it is in their best in interest to send everything it's just like the military it will help them with their credits once I get to a banner screen later on, this will make more sense to you. But if you open INB banner and you look at an application, there's a fancy little date that says application status date. Do not ever use this date for anything. <laughs> it does not work. <laughs> it, it works in the sense that it pulls the last date off the checklist. So it does pull off the last date that banner can find. However, if a transcript comes in and I waive the high school or I waive the ACT, it doesn't record that I waived it. It also doesn't record if I add something to the checklist. So it just doesn't give you a very accurate date to tell the student. So you just kind of have to do a little more digging or just you know, give me a call to say, hey, the student looks like he may have been floating around. Can you give me the whole story on it? So. Like I said, it'll make sense later. <laughs> okay. Now, just so you guys know, I have many, many reports running to track all of our students in the various stages. One of the big reports that I have is the NC list. When I have my student worker during the uh, school year, he's not here in the summer, um, his main job is the NC list. And he's going through our applications, making sure that when they applied that the program code is listed correctly, that it's actually a valid program um, and valid at that site, because you know things change and shift around, so we just watch that. Uh, some programs, like the Allied Health programs, they have requirements to have your nursing license or your dental hygiene license. That's picked up and cleared on this report. Um, he's also looking to see if readmit students can be pushed through faster because we have all their documents already. I'm sorry? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, let me see. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, he's also looking to see. <laughs> he's also looking to see if transcripts have come in before the application loaded. Sometimes this happens if you're meeting with a student and they bring you the transcript and it's official and we can take that, but they didn't apply right away. So I get that transcript. We have to hang on to it in a grades-only section of extender that you know is a little bit harder to find. So we go out and make sure transcripts that may be here are attached to the student's file, so don't worry, those aren't getting lost either. Um, and then all of that, once we make the application look pretty, remove holds and make sure everything's up to date, that's what loads into Salesforce and then the comm plan. 
like I said, that is what's emailed out to the students. So even if the students look at their app tracker on Monday, it may change by Wednesday. So just let them know that that's something that's ever changing and until they actually get an admissions decision to just keep checking that tracker. Questions, everybody has questions. So the students should be directed to their site because the site can answer the most questions. They answer questions about their application, financial aid, books, just being a student in the area, you know, all of those general questions. So I always advise that the students should see the general site first. If you have a really unique situation or it's time sensitive, like they need to be admitted right now to get registered right now to get their financial aid, feel free to email me at off-campus admissions. Um, again, multiple people check that, so you should receive an answer within 24 hours. And then I also have multiple folders in there to watch for students too. If you say you just met with somebody and they're going to request their transcript right now, I will watch for that transcript to come in if it's a priority student. Um, keep in mind that all students are a priority, but you can kind of filter out the ones that are really solid, that are really going to attend right now that are really on track and ready to attend because that first week before classes or the first week of classes <laughs> I'm sure you'll get some students but you kind of have to take a little judgment of are they really dedicated are they really ready to start right now because you don't want them to start off on the wrong foot and you don't want them to start behind and not make it in the class and then again um, any unique information that the sites can't change. I have more access in Banner if somebody needs to change an address or they spelled their name wrong on the application. That actually happens quite frequently. And birthdays, sometimes the birthday is wrong. So <laughs> if you see something on the checklist, you're like, why do you need their birthday? Well, they put that they were born in 2000. So, well, OK, 2010. <laughs> NC means not complete. Yep, sorry, I glossed over that part. And that's, when you go into Banner, you'll actually see that as a little code. It's just an incomplete application, something's missing. Any more questions? I kind of put breaks in to break up my train of thought. Yeah. I have a question. You want back on the beginning filtering the application? Uh-huh. There's two. It's one says statewide and one says online. Uh, let's get back. I'm kind of thinking about Yeah. I never use statewide. No, we typically use statewide if they're going to go to a classroom. If they're going to be attached with a CC. Yes. Yep. It's just saying online. Um, but I mean, when they get to then choosing the program. Yep. Yep. For example, like if I click online right here. Because I, I've been telling yeah. them to choose the IS yep. online, but that's a little too different. Actually, the way online than BIS. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, just to, just to clarify, what's a little screwy, I think Cheryl wants to talk about it later in the day. There are some locations where we may have set up to originally deliver a program locally. Alpine is a great oh, example. Yeah. And so actually you saw when she pulled up Alpina, BIS was one of the programs. Yeah. We never really took it off of that list, even though we know it's fully online now. Well, it's not. OK, so maybe that's still a good one then. But you will, sometimes you will see programs kind of funny that between online and face to face. So sorry. No, 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 that's a good question. Yeah. 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 We're, uh, Considering a new model for the uh, uh, ISI masters, okay. and one of the, one of the models we're looking at for both the masters and the new doc that we're creating is a required face-to-face -face class on campus, but it is taught virtually to wherever. So there will be never a requirement to anybody to be on campus 
where does something like that fit in? Because there will not necessarily be an on-campus requirement, but it will probably be listed as such because that's where we will be hosting the virtual okay, yeah. session from. Yeah. It would be considered online. Then, if yeah. the students don't need to travel, if the students don't need to go somewhere to take the class, right. then, then we're considering that online. If it's a distributed type where students, you have 10 students that are collecting in Midland in a classroom and 10 students no, it will be wherever they would want to be. I imagine that it would be a required time and date. Right, right. It's still online. We're struggling with in Banner how to designate time, dates and times for synchronous meetings in an online environment. But that, that, that's what we're looking at, especially yeah. when we're looking at within the next couple of years of creating the PhD. Uh, I saw but even in the we're looking at that as those that can't. Some we can't because there's physical. We must, you know, work with equipment. Well, talk mm -hmm. to me. Talk to me after about. <laughs> And actually, if you fill out a graduate application, you don't get the same drop downs that you do for an undergraduate. So that's something to keep in mind too, that if you click up above that you're a graduate student, you're not going to get all the options. It's, it's gonna be a little bit different for that. Casey, when a student goes in initially to the application site, mm -hmm. they've gotta fill out that, that initial information and they're supposed to get a password, they get an email back they do. How yep. long is that process supposed to take? It's supposed to be pretty quick. We've noticed that there's some issues with Hotmail. Um, Hotmail tends to slow it down and make it go through their spam filters a little bit longer. Um, so if any students are seeing that, they can call the main campus and we can send them out so their password right away. Quick, like within a minute or minutes? I would say minutes. I would say the longest I had to wait when we first got it up and running was 10 minutes. So, yep. And then, like I said, just to have the students check their spam filters and just to make sure that, you know, something didn't get hung up so at all. Anything beyond yep. that, there's an issue they need to yep. call campus. Yep. Yep, they do. Um, there's something as yes. Uh-huh. What? And who would they call? If they call the general 1-800 number, the comm center students will be able to take down their information, and then whoever's available to send out that email can send it out, because it's always... You know, it depends on who's there and at their desk, so, yep. Yeah, for uh, off-campus uh, business, um, mm -hmm. I often see students who are inactive and don't show up, and they seem to appreciate the, uh, the uh, short pre-admit application. Mm -hmm. It does, it does. Like if you, um, for example, how I had so many applications already going, it's always going to remember my date of birth, my social, my addresses, all that information, unless it changes. It gives me the opportunity to go in and change it, but if it doesn't, that auto-populates and they're pretty much just picking their semester and program. Probably keep on social. Yes, yep. The social is not required when you fill out an application. It does help that we match them up to the right person in Banner, so we're not getting duplicate records or duplicate ID numbers. One more, one more yeah. follow up um, uh, on application. Um, I have a student ask me, do they ask for your citizenship? And I said, yes, they do. And, uh, apparently, it was not here legally. And so I went through the application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What happens, you can do that and it'll accept it, but I'm going to hold it up once it hits me to be reviewed. What are we doing for those who are here, not here legally? If they say that they're undocumented, that's fine. We put it in the system that they're undocumented and then we leave it at that. And we educate. Yes. Yeah. I just okay. had a question um, that, that I thought of way back. Anyway, um, sometimes if we have students who are admitted to various programs, but they're taking classes at the local college for several semesters, they haven't taken a Ferris course. 
but they're using financial aid, you know, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. They still have to do the RAD. They still have to admit, uh, complete a new admission because they've never taken a peer support, correct? It depends on what they do. If they get admitted, say, for fall, but then they once they meet with you guys and look at their program plan, they have more CC classes to take. If they use the consortium form, that will keep them active because the consortium form adds placeholder classes on their fair schedule, and that's how we award the financial aid. So that, you know, kind of fools Banner into thinking that they're taking Ferris classes and keeping them active. If they do not do the consortium form, then they will need to reapply. Thank yes. What is, for a readmit, what is the rule? Two semesters, not summer, or what? If, if they're inactive for any reason, they need to reapply. If they're still active, they can register for classes. Um, and like I said, the, the students do get, they do tend to stay active if they use that consortium form. So it's really just a matter of looking to see if they're active. If a student applies and was admitted, for example, for fall, did not register for fall classes, they do not register for spring classes, and did not fill out any consortium forms in that time, they will be turned off after fourth day of spring. So they don't get the whole spring term to register for summer, they have to register by that fourth day count. Fourth day is kind of like a magical day where everything is locked into place and counted and that's their program. So if they get turned off in that, then they will have to reapply. Okay. Yep. In summer, like you said, summer fourth day does not do anything. There everybody is granted optional summer semesters. Yep. Casey, when you yep. said that someone would have to check to see if they're still active, for folks that don't have access to internet native banner, mm -hmm. they need to ask like a service office that does? Or is no. there another way to check? Where do they find it in the health General information. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And then that, just to clarify too, if a student is admitted for summer semester, their summer semester is a freebie again. So then they would get the fall and spring to register before they're shut off. So. So it's kind of a little tricky. You can't really say two semesters. Casey, in her PowerPoint later, but on the front of her handout is a little snapshot of the student information advisor menu. So one of your options there is that general student information. And she'll have that later in her presentation where that shows a student's, um, you know, their current status. Um, and that's just a good, it, it, before you even meet with a student, even to go out and look, um, because that's a good conversation to have with them if they're inactive and they're looking to register for classes. Okay. Bef well, before I get to that, um, if you log into your MyFSU and you're just on the first tab, first homepage landing that you get, on the left-hand side, there's going to be login links. And I believe Donna has been working on getting access for everybody to have Banner. If you didn't have it previously, you will have INB now. And you can just click on, it says Banner INB, and then it's going to bring up another pop-up, and then that's really Banner. I, I was going, let me see if the Ferris website is up, because if it's up, it, I can show it you. It is not. It is not now? No. no okay. It's been hacked overnight. And, oh, okay. Uh, they just have a placeholder in there for now. For okay. Working. Okay. So, so I. Yeah, you, 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 oh, okay. You got my FSU. Yeah, <laughs> did you go to Ferris or did you go to my FSU? Okay. 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 So you're in your MyFSU, over here on the left-hand side, there's this link for Banner INB. That's the link you're going to click to open up Banner INB. Once you click that, after the first time you won't get those pop-ups, um, you should get a pop-up window. Um, it's thinking. <laughs> 
But once you get the pop-up window, that's when you put in the form names, and that's when you can open up the forms in Banner. Where's my room? So, well, I have screenshots too. There it goes. You have to have a certain form of job, job too, so you might have to. Yep. There, it's listed on the TAC website what Java it plays nice with. Um, SADMS, S A A A D M S, is the form name. It means something in banner language. All those letters mean something. Um, and that is the application. So that's what the application looks on looks like on the back end. Um, but I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint because I actually have students pulled up that it'll be a better example for you. Is, uh, excuse me, is that, yeah. what, is that what, um, you're giving us access to? Yes. Can you show me again where you went to that? It wasn't in yeah. services? No, it's not. It's on your front page right here in your MyFSU. Uh, Just the general MyFSU tab. Once you send that in, um, they get access pretty quickly. Um, but it, this is really the only piece uh, that we're going to really have you look at um, because, unfortunately, in self-serve banner, which most of us use every day, um, there's not really a form built that shows the application piece. So um, it is an extra link, but it will be helpful for those who have <coughs> wanted to know when meeting with a student, hey, I just want to be able to look real quick to see where your application's at. This will give you access for that. It will also stop us from always when the student's in the room calling up Casey and saying, I'm here with the student. <laughs> She's always so gracious. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So these are some of the terms that I use all the time. So if I'm just, you ask me a question and I just, you know, talk like you should know it. Um, <laughs> here are some terms that I use. Again, SADMS, all uppercase, is the banner screen that you can go to look at. The checklist is going to be a tab in the banner screen, and the checklist is literally a list of all their application materials that we need. And it's going to have check marks on it and receive dates, and that's, that's the checklist for their application. NC is the not complete, incomplete status. CO means it is complete, means everything on the checklist has either been received or waived, and now they're ready for review. AR is an academic referral. That is the status that I put the application in if it needs to go out to an advisor to approve and admit. Um, their application was complete, and then I changed it to an at review. That way, it doesn't pop up anywhere that they need more information or they're waiting for review. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The CC is accepted. That is just a banner code that we use that the student is accepted, admitted, ready to go. <laughs> TI is transfer ineligible. That's something that we started using when we saw that students would apply and they weren't quite ready to start. Their GPA was fine. They just, they're either missing the 48 credits, they're missing a math, they're missing a technical class that they need to get started. We didn't really want to reject them because that's, that just seems a little harsh. Um, so we're just waiting for them to complete a requirement. So that's transfer and eligible. Transfer and eligible also allows their application to stay in a pending mode that as soon as we get that updated transcript, we can re-review you without extra work from the student. They don't need to reapply. They don't need to send anything but that updated transcript. And I do have reports running to catch that and to catch when transcripts come in. So again, the students aren't lost or just floating around there. They're still pending. The RJ is the denied or rejected code in Banner, so that one you might see, but nah, it's few and far between, luckily for us. Can you review yeah. the rejection policy? As sometimes in? It, sometimes it works in a student's oh, yes. best interest yep. to be rejected. Yep. 
Um, for example, a student has three colleges. The first one, say they went to Grand Valley or somewhere, and they didn't do so well because it was their first time away from home or you know the classes were a little more intense than they thought. So they didn't do so hot. And then they went to GRCC or Lansing, and they did spectacular. But if you combine the GPA, which is what we use for admission requirements, and they're below the GPA, it is in our best interest to deny them, have them take more 12, 12 more credits with a C or better, and then review them again. Because once they get that denied decision, anything that they did before it, we can just ignore and just go forward with what they take after that decision. So that is in their best interest sometimes to fill out an application, get denied, you know they're gonna be denied, and then move forward from there. Because if they keep going and keep going, it's really hard to boost a low GPA once you hit so many credits. If they were TI and they submitted to your transcript, it would have to be averaged in with the really low first college still. Yes, okay. exactly. Can we use TI because it's GPA for right. the most part? Right. But that's a good point, though, that if a student is TI'd, it doesn't mean that they only have to take the credits. When they're reviewed again, they still have to meet the GPA, too. So if their GPA goes down while they're TI'd, it's not a guarantee that they're going to get admitted as soon as they get those credits. So. And then canceled apps, if you look in SATMs and you see an application was canceled, um, you will have to call me or email me to ask why because there are specific comment sections on the application that only a few people can see. Um, we typically use a PC, which is a pending cancel, when we do that internally for some reason. The app is either expired or they, you know, they, they changed entry terms, they didn't meet our required time limit, that kind of thing. An SC is a student cancel, which means we got word from the student specifically that they wanted to be canceled. That's just the difference in the two cancelings. Okay, so here's Saddams again. And again, just a reminder, Internet Explorer 8 works best. <laughs> and here is Saddams all filled out. What works best on the Mac? I don't know. Firefox, okay. Are you? <laughs> Doug, Doug, Windows. Firefox. Firefox works okay? That's a virus, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a Mac. I don't, <laughs> I don't <sorry>. use that. <laughs> I have an iPhone if that counts. <laughs> okay, so if you go into Statums, say you don't know their ID number. You don't have to have their ID number. You at least have to have one digit of their last name. It's gonna give you everybody <laughs> that starts with an N or a D, but that's just good to know that if you got a voicemail from someone and you're like, I'm not sure if that ended with a Y or an I or you know, kind of how they spelled it, you can just type in partial names with a percent sign after it, that's the wild card, and Banner will spit out everybody that fulfills that requirement. So that's just a good tip that if you're looking for somebody, kind of play around with the names because another thing too is you don't know how they applied. If it's a Tom or a Thomas or a Tommy, it depends on what they put on their application as to what loads to banner. So I see that a lot too, that people will put Tom on an application, but their transcript comes in as Thomas. So you kind of just have to play around a little bit with that. And for the sake of time today, because everybody doesn't have their computer right in front of them, um, Casey and I will work on a short tutorial video. Um, but again, very easy. And we, we assume that the majority of time that you might want to use SATMs is really when you're sitting in front of a student that you're advising and at that moment. So they should know the spelling of their name because it should be a little easier for you to look up. Um, but we will create that, that short tutorial video for you. And then if you have any questions, um, once you have an opportunity to play around, um, don't hesitate to ask any of us. Okay. I'm going to walk away a little bit. Saddams gives you a lot of information. Up here, the entry term, it's in a code. It's in the year, and then the two last digits are what semester they're starting. 08 for fall, 01 for spring, 
05 for summer, and that corresponds with the month that they're starting in. Uh, the application number, you have to watch because if they have more than one application, you'll have a scroll bar and you'll have to scroll if you want to see more information. This date is when it loaded to banner. That does not mean when they filled it out. So if they filled it out on a Saturday, but we didn't load it till Monday, again, there's a little lag time in that date. Admission type, transfer, readmit, freshman, just that general information. Um, over here is that date that I told you never to use. <laughs> so ignore that date. <laughs> but you can see this is where up here, the application status, that's where it's going to say NC, CO, or D for a decision. And then of course, if it's D and there's a decision, you can see what the decision is and when it was. Coming down here, you have the term, the program. If it's a program that is a little funny that has like this, a certificate and an associates and a bachelor's, you'll have to watch to make sure you have the bachelor's or if they really want the certificate to make sure they really just have the certificate, um, undergraduate and campus. This is where everything loads from the application. Oops. This is the checklist. This is the fourth tab on SADAMS. And then again, it just is a checklist of all their information. For every transfer student, these three items will always load no matter what they put on their application. If they don't put any colleges on their application, but they list that they're a transfer, this is going to load as a blank institution. It's just going to say CLT1 because they listed that they're a transfer, so they have to come from somewhere. Um, if they list that they came from somewhere, it's going to fill in, which is great because it's going to tell us where they came from. Everybody, no matter how they apply, freshman, transfer, readmit, everything, gets a high school because they have to come from somewhere. So if they don't fill out the high school information, again, it's going to load as a blank high school, but it's going to be out there that we need it. So that just kind of gives you an idea of what the checklist looks like. When documents come in and get reviewed, that's your receive date. If something is waived, you're gonna have this little check mark is not there. That means it's not mandatory and it means that they don't have to submit it. This person submitted it anyway, so you're gonna get a receive date over there. If this is unchecked, and the high school is unchecked too, and the received dates are blank, that's fine because they're waived. So that would still make them complete. And then again, this was a nursing, so they had to submit additional information for a nursing's license. So maybe some who had their associates and then didn't need to bring the high school transfer. Yes, yep. Um, for some of the programs like nursing, <laughs> They have to have specific math classes and English is already done, and their ACTs can help them with that because it shows placement into the next one. So it is beneficial to send everything. Um, the new regulation is you have to have an associates awarded to waive the high school. We take into consideration if the student has at least 60 transferable credits. If they have a lot of credits taken that they will get awarded, not just taken as failed or withdrew, if they have 60 transferable, we can waive it for admissions, but they might be picked up through financial aid for the ability to benefit and need that in order to award their financial aid. So it's in their best interest to send the high school. Most high schools don't charge for transcripts like a college does, and it only takes a phone call to the office to say send my transcript. So it's a little bit easier to get a high school transcript than it is a college transcript. We do see, uh, Mike McCaw has a good example. Um, um, sometimes we even see that a student has an associate's degree, and they really only have 32 transferable credits on the system. The associates will supersede the, the 32, so we can admit them. And so once in a while, that's a, we see it just every once in a while, <coughs> CJ students, but, you know, that does happen. <laughs> uh, 
But the fact that they have an associate's degree, we are able to admit them. So if it's a program that you need 48 credits to get in, the fact that they have an associate's degree, we will let them in. So, But, but you're also saying that financial aid may say you got to have it. Well, in that case, they have an associate. So okay. um, that's more financial aid. Um, when the policy came out to require um, high school if they don't have an associate, that was all based upon financial aid saying that. So we have some flexibility with that 60 transferable um, credits for associates. Does everybody know about our misconduct question on the application? Anybody not know about that? OK. <laughs> our misconduct question on the application, we ask it to filter out the students that have a questionable background. Um, it used to be more in depth, and we were flagging everybody if they had a DUI or a suspension from high school, that kind of stuff. We've narrowed it down now that we are only checking the felonies. If they say that they have been convicted or charged or anything, like that on the application, you will see additional items pop up on the checklist. The student has to submit in writing what they did, why they checked that. If they, if they click yes to misconduct on the application, another box pops up so they can just put it on, on the application. They don't have to actually send us a letter later. So that'll load to the checklist. And then once we receive all their transcripts, we run a background check on them, see if it matches up with their story, see what they did, and then review them to see if they're OK to be admitted. Because we really want to keep our campus, and even if they're an online student, they have the ability to come to any of our campuses. So we want to keep those a little bit safe. Yep. Do you run a background check on everybody, or just those who check that box? Just those that check the box that also have a rough story <laughs> um, okay. we tend to we tend because we do have to pay for the background checks so we don't want to run them on everybody for anything um, we typically run them for CSCs or any weapons charges if they checked misconduct and their explanation filtered down into that yeah one of the one of the things answer yes to misconduct, but didn't really read that question clearly. Unfortunately, they still have to go through. They, they can still submit their explanation, um, but we do see that every once in a while, where someone doesn't read that question clearly. How, how long does that take? Because that particular. That could hold up their application. Someone. Well, it couldn't have, because she met with me one week and was admitted and down here and met with me the next week. Okay. They told me she had two felony convictions. One, we should probably check her application. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once in a while, for example, on. years ago, we had a respiratory care student who um, check everybody. never put that on her application yeah. up until that they were going to do clinicals and then came out. Um, so one, that's a good thing. So if you ever hear that and you, and you see on their application and their checklist that they were there's no PSPY out there, then yeah, that's. I know what student you're talking about, so we'll look at hers. Is there a sunset on this that it's only in the last X number of years, or it depends on it depends on what it is. Um, they typically, and I say they because it is a different committee that reviews misconduct. They do have to get cleared through misconduct before they get to me to look at their academics. Um, so the misconduct committee, if they're still on um, probation. They tend to wait until the probation is done before clearing somebody. Um, and again, it goes back to what it is. It, it really is just what right. did they do, what's their offense. There's nothing automatic. So nope. it doesn't depend no. on what it is because all of it will go through review regardless yes. if it is 10 years old. Yes. Yep. Everything goes to somebody to review. There's three of them that get together and review. And then if the student gets a decision that they were denied because of misconduct, there is an appeal process if they want to submit more documents to actually I get there. It's only adult misconduct, anything? Correct. Yeah. Yes. And just so you yep. know, we don't see a whole lot of students 
no, denied no. or rejected um, for misconduct. And so that's why I think it's a good rule of thumb, any advising appointment, to even have that open conversation to say, if you feel like sharing, if you have anything on your record, it's a great conversation for us to have um, as it might you know, be a hurdle of getting an internship. Um, and because we do see quite a large number of students that do mark yes on the misconduct and have felonies, um, that doesn't necessarily, they're denied from a program CJ or nursing, but there are certain um, felonies uh, that might be getting a, a job or an internship um, or it might just be a struggle. So that's a good conversation to even open the door so that they can feel okay, like they Okay, but if they, if they don't check the box, it doesn't go to committee, it doesn't go to anything, but if we find out that they have a felony after that, do we kick them out for false application? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like for example, that respiratory student um, years ago when it came out a couple years, um, yes, he okay. would let go from there. And the other thing to remember too, once they're admitted and they're a student, if they keep attending and then something happens that they now have a charge, we don't really have any way of going back and checking that so they don't get re-reviewed after they're admitted. But that's why you do the re a lot of times. Yeah. In yep. a year's time. Yeah, if they left and then something happened, yep, they have to fill that out again. So here's some things that are always on the checklist. ACT, I didn't talk about waiving it. If a student is 23 years old or older, we waive the ACT for them. Um, it's just something that Ferris has in its policy to waive for them. If they've completed 60 college credits, have an associates, the English, the math. Because the ACT, if they're a transfer student, we don't use the ACT for admission requirements. It's more, where are we gonna start them out? What math are they starting? What English are they starting? What kind of classes can they get into? Uh, college transcripts, high school transcript. GED will show up as something different than high school just because we have a different code for it. It's the same thing. Um, if you see an NUT with a number behind it, there's going to be an explanation over in the description as to why I put that out there because we need an updated transcript. You know, if they sent us one five years ago and it has work in progress, I'm gonna like to see an updated transcript before making an admission decision because you know it could go either way on something like that. And then here's some other things that could be on the checklist. I'm gonna to have to go a little bit quicker because I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, but if you see something on the checklist that you just don't know what it is or why it's there, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll look into it because sometimes it doesn't need to be there. So those are some things on the checklist. So if you're in your MyFSU, I'm sure you're familiar with the advisor menu. Um, down here on the bottom, is your extender documents. If you click that, that's going to show you all the paper copies that we received. We tend to try to keep one college all together. So if they only went to GRCC, all the GRCC transcripts that they ever sent to us should be all linked together in one large file. So when I go into extender, I typically <coughs> just flip right to the back page. Because when a transcript comes in, it's always scanned to the back of whatever's there already. So if I flip to the back page, I'm seeing the most recent transcript, I'm seeing the most up-to-date grades and GPA. And then you can go forward based on that. Um, that's just what I do to make it easy because you know once a student hits their fourth year here and they're ready to graduate, they, they might have 20 transcripts that they sent us and you really just want the last one. Mm -hmm. Are you required to put in those back pages that list all the information? Can, we are not. Can we're trying. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> we're trying to cut down on the back pages. Um, again, all of our transcript processing, it's done by student workers, and they do a fabulous job. But student workers rotate out, so you just have to keep continual training, and it's more of a 
we forgot to tell you we don't need the back of every MOT transcript that comes in. Yeah. Um, if it's an out of state, we do make sure that the backs are in there because it's out of state and you don't know if it's quarters or semesters or accreditation, you know, so we try to give you more information if it's an out of state school. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is pertinent here, but if, how do you know when that last page has been added? That's where we're having some trouble. Where, okay. and is that on the weekly list? Yes. Okay. Yep. Once a transcript, once a college <coughs> transcript is processed in the admissions office, that prints out on a report to the colleges that there's a new transcript. They get that list weekly, but that list always does a date range. So unless you keep that list, you're not going to see back transcripts because the next list is only going to show you the next date range. It's not going to show you everybody that we had in the past month. So in a sense, they really have to check the whole thing to make sure. Yep. Yep. Okay. So. Jason, there, yeah. there's no way if you have a student with three or four different schools that they submitted the transcripts from to know which one when you go in there, there's no? Unfortunately, no, the coding isn't there. Um, okay. It just says college transcript. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and they do shift orders. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, um, but say they went to GRCC, LCC, and MOT, and they were in those order the first time you met with the student, but now they have a MOT, since that's the most updated, MOT is going to be first. Okay. Because okay. Extender says, hey, this is new. Let me shoot you up to the top of the list. Okay. So you will notice that that's new, too. Okay, so I think that's what's causing some problems when a student says, I sent my transcript two weeks ago, and yep. we're saying we don't have it. It's yep. trying to figure out how to check or where to find it, correct? Yep. If it's not an Extender, then you can check with admissions because it may be in that lag time of it's stamped. It's just not an extender yet. So, but if it's an extender, it's here and it might not be processed yet as far as putting the credits, the number of credits out on soap call for you. When I look for a student in SSB, I always, always, always use ID selection future former. This does not mean it won't give you active students. It just means that if you happen to have a term in there already picked, it's going to pull everybody rather than looking at that term. Because I don't know if you've noticed, if you have fall picked, but they're not a fall admit, it's not going to show them to you. But if you always pick this future former, it's going to give you everybody. So that's just a little tip to use that, ignore the first one. And then the hold screen, if you look at the holds advisor add remove, that's going to show you all of the information. If you only look at the view only holds, that's only going to show you what's active right now. Let me show you my example. This is what came up when I picked on the advisor add and remove. You can see that there's a current hold at the top. A future hold that will be on their account later and then all their expired holds so that gives you the whole picture rather than just looking at what they have active the future holds you want to watch the from date so on September 15th this hold is gonna start and it's gonna go until forever at least I won't be here by then so that's forever and then some of these you can see that they when they expired. Some of the dates like this, they match. And that's the way we fool Banner to say, start it and end it on the same day so it's never there. Because we don't want to just record remove it and delete it and get it off the record because we want to keep it there showing it was out there. But if they fulfilled it before it started, we can't put a date that's before this one over here. Does that make sense? So that's just something to look at um, for the students to get all their holds and all their history. We have a lot of students that um, call because they had a hold. Um, and so 
if you have a student that calls you or contacts you and says, I have a hold on my account, the majority of the time, the hold that they can see, because they have access to see this information on their banner, on their MyFSU, um, it tells them exactly what that hold is and usually gives them a telephone number or the right person mm -hmm. to contact. So mm -hmm. nine out of ten times, the information is right there, they're just not maybe looking at that. Um, and yeah. Happens, like if, business office. Yeah, the student will be able to see all of this. So they're going to be able to see who put it on, what number to call, and if there's something, you know, listed. Granted, this field right here can only allow so many characters, so sometimes you will see a little truncated message, but most of the time it makes sense as to what it was. Um, in this column, you can see who put it on. Um, that's Deb downstairs in the business office. That's me. So if you see something like this, it was added from self-serve banner. Um, if you see something like this, that's just a weird, crazy name. That's an automatic program that runs in the background adding holds to students that meet criteria. So sometimes the hold may not need to be out there if it's an off-campus person. Just let me know. We'll take care of it. Okay, so this is where you can see, without opening up INB, if the student's active or not. Again, you're going to want to pay attention to the very top, to where it says what they're active for, to when they're active. Because if that says up there, spring of 14, they're not going to be able to register for fall because they're not active until spring of 14, and then to the end of time. If that end of time says, something that's not end of time. <laughs> Their program is only good until then. So that may indicate to you that they did a program change and then the next semester it's gonna be effective. So that's something to watch. Um, their status up there, it's gonna be no show, active, graduated, just kind of those pretty much. Um, you're not really gonna see, you might see an academic dismissal every now and then. And then that's going to give you the site that they're at, some of their information. This class standing pulls off their transfer credits and their, trans or their Ferris credits that they have. So that's just going to give you where they're at on our credits. It doesn't really mean that they're in the third year, fourth year of their program. Advisor information, that should be your information. If it's not, let me know and I'll get it changed or you know, let the site know and they can change it. time I ever hear that I have a student that is now assigned to me is the student says, by the way, you're my advisor now, I just got changed. Is there any way that this system can generate a, you know, you've got a new advisee, here's his contact information? Uh, it shouldn't be that we're the last to know that we now have somebody new or somebody's been dropped mm -hmm. off from our list for some reason. The students are constantly telling me, uh, you were my advisor, but all of a sudden they took me away from you. Why? And uh, I, that would be the first time I ever heard of it. Yeah. The, so. hard, the hard part is the advising list that we send out saying you have a new student should only, I believe it only runs on Mondays. So if somebody's admitted on Tuesday or Wednesday and they call our office and say, okay, what's my next steps? Who's my advisor? They, mit, they might get to you before that report gets to you. No, you're missing my question. Oh, okay. They're already here. And I, I don't remember seeing them tell me even when I get a new admit, I've got a new advisor ever or advising other than if they happen to get a schedule. So evidently, I'm not getting any notices. Okay. But let's say that they got admitted last year. This year, somebody in the system someplace took them off of my advising list and gave them to somebody else. There is no record of that anywhere other than the student just says, I just noticed I have a different advisor. How come? I haven't got a clue. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, that happens fairly regularly. It that, does. Yeah. And, and uh, it, it bothers the students and it kind of confuses us. Is there mm -hmm. any way that when a field such as who's your advisor changes, you can kick out a, oh, by the way, this changed. Send that, that faculty a notice. Mm -hmm. You could work with, because that, yeah. that sounds like someone maybe in your team's 
office that has changed that. We don't opt in unless I don't know, but it's. But we send a copy of the dean's office. You could right. probably, right, you could probably ask for an individual uh, web focus report that maybe pulls that information. When should I ask for that? Because how would I know something to change to, to know to ask? Because I'm not sitting around wondering mm -hmm. who changed. Well, what I'm saying yeah. is that, that you could ask for an individualized web focus report that gets sent to you or something that you could pull or someone sends to you once a week that gives you that picture of what new advisees were added to my list or what new, I mean, new advisees added well, to your list. Well, I, I know I can look and, and go manually go in and see who's my advisees this week and then compare that against last week's report. But that's why I was asking if there's some way that we can be more proactive when, it's, when it changes. It happens I, fairly, I think, relatively um, often. This, and I, I do think that there, there are some particular things within ISI where the advisors were changing more rapidly than typical. Um, but I think the suggestion of maybe we can put this on a parking lot somewhere to readdress the whole area where we do switch an advisor. We have been lax in two areas in the past. One, notifying the student. We update Banner, but we forget to tell anybody yes. that we update that's, it. That's what so, I'm talking about. And so you're right. when we do a bulk change. Right now, it, it, yeah. it, this year, we went through some, some changes. Yeah, but, yeah. So but it, I think that, that was more lost. this year, but, but it still has happened. Sure. And, and, sure. Uh, and the students will call up and say, why yep. did I change? Yeah. But it's new so students, think, too. It's not just changes. I mean, just no yeah. new students. Well, and yeah. you, we can get you on the distribution list, the weekly distribution list for new students. That would, that would take that problem out of the picture. And then the bulk changes, we probably need a process that notifies the student, notifies the advisor, sends the postcard. That's part of why you're getting pictures taken today. We have an awesome postcard um, that, that goes that to the student the saying, and here's what they look like, and here's how you contact them. Yeah. Uh, we just did that with Dion and Katie and rearranging mm -hmm. some students. So. That Dawn, can you and, and Jocelyn? Yes, and I think we did work uh, with Jen Hagenauer. I want to say that it's built into the communication plan, but if it's not, we'll make sure that it is, that if an advisor changes, that they get an email. Well, not just a student, but, but we need these yes, folks we to will do that with the advisors. And, and too. most of our is not there is a problem because I'm the only Delta advisor. Yeah. And I'm the only Lansing here at Grand Rapids where you're going to have a couple of possibly in yeah. Traverse City for a, at least a while for a couple. Yeah. Well, and when you've got, you know, students that had Greg, Greg's gone for a semester, so you want to reassign them, you need a way to communicate that to everybody. So. Yeah, we can pull those okay. reports and send them to your parents. Yeah. That, would, that would be helpful, so because things get changed and, and we, we have no idea they were changed. Those, Doug, when they fall, when they send them, they'll go to your parents. Yeah, no, that's fine. I cannot use it, but I can always receive it. I haven't been able to use my Ferris email account for over two years. Listen. Well, I'm getting a little short on time, so I'm just going to kind of push on on some of the other stuff I have. Um, my next couple of slides were regarding undeclared students. So it, I think I'm just going to glance over that a little bit. Um, undeclared requests, we really only use it if it's extenuating circumstances that they really need to get in, they can't get their transcripts here, that kind of thing. Um, it is not used for non-degree or guest students. That's all a main campus thing. Um, I will not use it in June when there's plenty of time to get in for August. So again, like I said, it's just either personal reasons that they want to take a class or they need to take a class to get eligible to start in a later semester or it's really close to the deadline. Um, if you have more information or more questions on that, just let me know because there is something that we have to send to the student, an agreement that they have to say, yes, I know I'm going to be undeclared. I'm not going to get a program plan. I'm not going to get financial aid. It's, it's undeclared. <laughs> so they do have to sign it or virtually sign it and send it back to us. So just let me know if you have somebody in that situation. Uh, program changes. If a student wants to change programs, 
We recommend that they meet with you first to discuss why they're changing, is the program right for them, do they meet the requirements, and then you give us that information in the program change form. Um, I only need that if the student is already admitted. If they're not admitted, they haven't really made it to you yet through the application process, so I can just change that on the application. Um, a program change is not an entry term change, meaning if they're staying in CIS Grand Rapids, they just want to move to spring, just send an email and we'll move them to spring. I had that question this uh, spring, and uh, I have a student that got married and is moving from Delta down to Grand Rapids. Okay. Uh, and that, no, there is a program change form that they have to fill out, and where would they get that? It's actually just for you guys to fill out because, for, uh, yep. Where would we get that? Yep. Oh, I have it on the next slide. It's located in your MyFSU, but I will also send out an email with the link, because if you save the link, it's a lot easier to get to, because it's kind of buried in your MyFSU. Um, it's an intranet form, so it's secure, and it comes right to my email. So that's why the students can't fill it out. Because if you fill out the form to change a student's program, you are saying they meet the requirements. I'm saying that they're okay to move into this program. I'm saying that it's okay to change them. So if you're not the person for that program, please don't fill out the form because it's gonna have to go get more approvals if it's not coming from the right person. So again, they meet with you. You can fill out the form. The form's received in my office. I process the information on Banner and then let everybody that needs to know know. It goes dean's office, financial aid, departments. If any holds need to be added or removed, those people know. Um, a lot of times if they're moving from main campus to off campus, you'll see some of those main campus holds out there that gets removed when they get changed over. Um, the program change form, like I said, this is the link, but if you wanted to find it in your MyFSU, those are all the steps you have to go to to find it. <laughs> so I'll just send out the link so you have that. Um, let me just show it to you really quickly. I'm sorry, I'm going over my time. <laughs> um, it's kind of just like the application where you have to answer questions first before you get more drop downs. Um, Maybe it won't go. Because you have to have the student name, ID, and then you have to tell me if they're changing programs. That's your first option. Full, complete, um, complete primary program. Or you can say, I only want to add a secondary program to their primary program. That's your second option. So then you can click yes for that option, and then it'll give you more information. Or you have a third option that you're changing or adding their minors. And then if you pick the secondary program or minors, their primary program stays the same. Nothing happens with their primary, we're just messing with, they're either getting a certificate in addition to it or um, an associates as well or their minors. So there's three different ways to fill that out. On the program change form, we did add a new box that says I have instructed the student to contact financial aid because financial aid will change based on program and location. Um, so that's something Lindsay will talk about, but that's something that you definitely have to be aware of that if they're a main campus student, they may lose some scholarships by moving off campus because main campus is awarded more scholarships. Yeah. On secondary ed, if um, a student changes a major, I just had this problem show up. Okay. Uh, they, we changed the major only, left, left the minor the same as English, mm -hmm. but somehow it dropped the English minor. How did that happen? I don't know. Okay. Because Do you know the student? There was a problem and uh, mm -hmm. there was no minor and they had to go through. Okay, it so shouldn't. It shouldn't drop the minor unless the minor is the same as what they're moving into. Okay. Yeah, it shouldn't drop it. So okay. let so me know when we'll fix that. that. Yep. Yep. And then I guess I just want to remind everybody that I have multiple, multiple reports running all the time to catch 
all of the different processes for our students. Um, but if you feel like somebody's slipping through the cracks or needs attention, please just email the off-campus admissions and we'll look into it and make sure they get on the right track. Um, I'm going on my sixth year here, so I've been trying to streamline things as, as I can and try to get the students through as quickly as possible. Any more questions? I don't know if you mentioned this earlier or not, but yeah. can we get an electronic version of this so that I don't have to share yeah. the paper now? Yeah, Maybe sure can. Email it to everybody. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I just want to say that you did an awesome job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.